It is 1978. The Chinese economy has barely functioned in decades. Tens of millions of people have died because of Chairman Mao Zedong's disastrous economic and social policies. People on the countryside are starving. Life was so desperate that in rural Zhaogang, 18 peasant farmers did the unthinkable. They defied the communist system of collective agriculture and divided the land so that each family could farm its own plot. It sounded very much like what Mao called the capitalist road. They actually signed a pact in blood, certain that if discovered, they would all be punished for their treachery. And their leader, Yan Junshang, could be executed. They were discovered, but no one was sentenced to death. No one was even punished. Instead, they were hailed as revolutionary heroes in Deng Xiaoping's emerging era of reform. 18 peasant farmers in a remote, lonely village lit the spark that inspired Deng Xiaoping and ignited one of the most extraordinary economic transformations in history. Deng Xiaoping guided China from an impoverished rural country to an urbanized world leader in a single generation. By the time he stepped down as paramount leader in 1989 and retired from politics in 1992, he had led the country through unprecedented change. This is the story of how he did it. And it is the story of people whose lives have been transformed by his open and reform policies. Dunn cited the old Chinese saying that he crossed the river by groping for stones, balancing openness and control one step at a time, adapting ancient systems to modern problems. Westernizing China while still affirming he was continuing Mao Zedong's revolution. Deng didn't leave the Maoist vision behind. University of British Columbia professor Timothy Brook edited the Harvard six volume history of Imperial China. He tried to leave that in place to some extent, this, this idea that the state should control everything and then enliven that and perhaps enrich that with a recognition that commerce actually doesn't take wealth out of the economy, it brings wealth into the economy. Deng understood that principle very well. Deng was a fellow revolutionary at Mao's side, but they were very different leaders. While Mao was vain, idealistic, and mercurial, Deng was modest, pragmatic and steady. In 1978, a few years after Mao's death, Deng began methodically to reinvigorate China's once prosperous economy. I think he was influenced by certain ideas about the greatness of China. 
and about the strength of history. Ezra Vogel is the author of Deng Xiaoping and the Transformation of China. He'd been through a lot, and he was tough. By the time he came to power, he was so knowledgeable and had been through so much. And at five feet tall, didn't seem like a person suffering from inferiority complex. He was fully confident and uh, ready to go. Chairman Mao had his little red book. Deng Xiaoping turned the page. He was prepared to say, nuts to ideology. Um, what matters is, does it work? Dr. Stephen Davies is with the Hong Kong Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences. Deng Xiaoping knows that China has squandered the first 50 years of the revolutionary government through insane experiments by Mao Zedong. Something has got to change. He knows he's got strong opposition from hardline leftists. He has to come up with something that he thinks is going to open China to the way the world is going. And he comes up with this brilliant idea of the special economic zone. The first special economic zone was the area neighboring the capitalist haven of Hong Kong, the traditional southern gate to the west. Creates these replicas of the old treaty ports in which China's own rules don't strictly apply in order to create a route in for capital, innovation, in order to kickstart China's own accumulation of wealth, which can then get it rolling on the developmental road. Opening up to business meant bringing in businessmen. Deng Xiaoping gave me all the freedom to lay down all the conditions of the free zone. In Shenzhen, Alan Lau was the first. That time, Shenzhen, the population only 21,000. It's like a village. There's hardly to have any business there. Because no material, no food, nothing. The modest footbridge between Shenzhen and Hong Kong was more of an impassable fence than a gate. When Deng opened it, people and capital flooded back and forth. Shenzhen is considered the stepping stone. What started in Shenzhen spread. When Dun rose to power, 80% of China's population lived in a million small villages. Now, more than half the population live in cities. He initiated nothing less than the greatest human migration in history. This was not the capitalist road, it was the capitalist highway. But Dun was leading a communist country with a collective mindset. He led, but stayed in step. He was at once progressive and autocratic, open-minded and iron-fisted, a reformer and a revolutionary. Mao compared himself to the great emperors, a founder of a new dynasty. Dun did not consider himself a son of heaven, but he knew uncontrolled urbanization could threaten the order and his mandate. So he continued the old system of household registration called Hukou. Hukou ties an individual to his or her place of origin. Without local Hukou, one loses the right to subsidized health care, education, and welfare. The Hukou system was firmly in place in the 14th century. Everyone had to be registered within a unit. The who is the household, the co is the individual within the household. The benefit is that the state always knows where everybody is. Dunn used to co as both an accelerator and a brake. He needed more workers in the cities, but not all at once. That, he feared, could create chaos. He felt, and I think he was correct, they would just overwhelm the schools, they would overwhelm the food supply. They couldn't allow it. His view, all during the period of his rule from 78 to 92, 
was that you could gradually increase the population coming to the cities, but you can't do it too fast. Foucault plays a powerful role in the Ma family's daily life. Ma Jing Yuan was only five years old and his sister was two when their single mother uprooted them. They moved from Qinghai province, one of the poorest areas in China, to the city of Hami, where there was family support. The move had dramatic consequences. They weren't registered in their new province. Without Huko, the only way her children could get an education was for their mother to pay higher tuition fees. Eventually, the school would issue their mother an ultimatum. Only one child could stay in school. She chose her son. When Ma's mother finally got a better paying job, the teachers allowed her to pay the tuition fees by installments, so Ma's sister could go to school too. But without local huko, Ma's prospects remained limited. If he wanted higher education, he couldn't stay. Ma enrolled in applied science at Minzu University in Beijing, China's top university for ethnic minorities. He joined the army to help pay for his education. Ma's story epitomizes the new China, the heavy hand of Huko holding him back, but the prospect of an education potentially freeing him. During the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s, Chairman Mao closed the universities. He urged his followers, the Red Guard, to ridicule and persecute intellectuals. Dun knew education was the lever of change. China has traditionally honored education. Deng tapped into a hunger to learn and succeed. Ma Jinhuan grew up in Xinghai before his mother moved the family to Hami, both far from China's economic recovery. Peng Lai is a wealthier city on the coast, east of Beijing. That's where Anna Huang lives. Anna's from the new middle class. Her father is a civil servant. As an only child, Anna is the center of her parents' world and their ambitions. Anna is an example of life in China under Deng Xiaoping's controversial one-child policy. Deng Xiaoping's one-child policy was authoritarian, draconian, and effective. Under Mao Zedong, the idea was that Chinese should multiply as quickly as they can in order to make China even bigger and stronger than it was. The demographic effects were a disaster. So under Deng Xiaoping, China implemented the one-child policy because China's population growth was occurring at a rate that was basically eating up all possible surplus that the economy could generate. The one-child policy was essential for getting the Chinese economy back on track. Combining his new one-child policy with Hukou, 
Dunn required that pregnant women go to a government office to apply for a certificate to give birth. A second child would either mean severe fines or that child would not be given HUCO registration. My judgment is that he was right, that if you had allowed more children to be born, you didn't have enough food. They already had a billion people when he came to power. And a lot of people were really very short of food. The one-child policy stayed in effect throughout Dung's leadership. It began to be phased out in 2015, 18 years after his death. Population control and opening up the economy. In one generation, Deng Xiaoping lifted about 600 million people out of poverty. In 1978, no one was poorer than the farmers of Zhaogang. That's why the 18 farmers' defiance of collective agriculture was so significant. They inspired others to follow in their path. Deng Xiaoping's policy of Ge Ti Hu built off what the 18 farmers initiated. Ge Ti Hu literally means individual household enterprises. Deng was encouraging the creation of small family businesses. He knew that in China there was untapped ambition. Gong Hangbing was quick to take advantage of the opportunity. When Deng Xiaoping came to power, several hundred million young people were out of work. The communist state couldn't hire them. So many young people had been sent down to the countryside to labor during the Cultural Revolution. Dung was ready to let them come back. And when they got back, they didn't have jobs. So he said, we have to worry about what these people are going to do in the cities. To have them unemployed is going to be terrible. We're going to have to let them open up their little shops by themselves and to allow little private enterprise. Gong Hangbing was a poor farmer tied to fields and working in a struggling government factory until Gu Ti Hu loosened the bonds and gave him a chance. In Shenzhen and the Special Economic Zone, Alan Lau spent the 1980s in the glow of success and mounting riches. It was his time. I'm the first house project, first hotel, first shoe factory, first shoot factory. Aside from that, I have also many other factories in China. What was the total investment in Shenzhen back then? 200 million US, you know, the foreign currency, I got 200 million. And 100 million I borrowed from the bank. <laughs> But Lao was getting cocky, building infrastructure, but moving too fast, making a fortune, but getting showy, too showy for some hardline communists. I'm the first one who's driving to Shenzhen. 
The first car is my limousine, extra long, like the limousine in the airport. <laughs> There's an old Chinese saying, the bird that flies at the front of the flock is the one they shoot. I want to be the pioneer. I want to show China that I can make it. Gong Hangbing tried several businesses, from children's toys to women's clothing, before he settled on silk flowers, an enterprise which Chinese artisans and entrepreneurs have engaged in for centuries. Even Deng Xiaoping briefly worked in a plastic flower factory when he was young. Gong started his silk flower business with his wife, and they still work together. It was this flower in a model's hair that launched their success. University life from Ma Jinyuan in Beijing is going well. He's in his final year, but barely has enough money to get by. The subsidies he receives from his army service help, but he sends a lot of money home to his family. Soon he must decide what to do when he graduates. Anna Huang is fielding calls from home. Her parents have diligently guided her studies. Anna's parents are determined that their only child pursue a career in the civil service. That's what her father did. That's what is expected of her. A prestigious, secure job in a dizzying vortex of change. It's appealing, but the civil service candidates must face an incredibly difficult series of examinations. A million compete every year, and only a tiny percentage pass. It is one of the most competitive exams in the world. Deng Xiaoping made it clear he wanted to create a meritocracy. Like so many of Deng Xiaoping's initiatives, bringing back the civil service exams seemed new and innovative, when in fact he was reaching into the past, reinstating the traditional but almost forgotten imperial examinations. The imperial examination system was shut down in 1905, and that left educated Chinese puzzled to know what their role was going to be in the future. The response with the coming of the People's Republic of China was to give those jobs to members of the Communist Party. 
that was discovered to be good at one level in terms of the loyalty of this cadre to the party, but it was also found not to be so great in terms of attracting the best and the brightest. And so Deng Xiaoping brought in a much more meritocratic examination system. The civil service examination was a way of recruiting smart people from every level of society. In Beijing, Ma Jianyuan has made a major decision. He will take the civil service exams. Deng Xiaoping told Time magazine in 1985, if you want to bring the initiative of the peasants into play, you should give them the power to make money. He could have been talking about Gong Hangbing. When he was given the opportunity, there was nothing stopping him from chasing riches. He is now a multi-millionaire businessman with 400 employees and a sales staff that stretches across China. Nothing exemplifies Deng's famous declaration that it's glorious to be rich, like the Canton Fair in modern-day Guangzhou. The Canton Fair is expansive and extravagant, as only a Chinese fair can be. The exhibit space is more than one million square meters. There are more than 60,000 booths, with business transactions over $28 billion. At the Canton Fair, West meets East, as it has for centuries. Canton was where swashbuckling trading companies from the West once thrived. If you want to do business in China, this is the best place to start. The West has knocked on China's doors before with disastrous results. The cannons facing out to sea are vivid reminders of gunboat diplomacy and bullying. The opium wars of the 1800s between Britain and China were defining moments in Chinese history. Western merchants eager for Chinese tea, selling opium to the Chinese, importing it for home use, and making fortunes on the backs of the people. The symbol of the brutality of imperialism is on display at the once glorious Old Summer Palace. It was sacked, looted, and set ablaze during the Second Opium War. It lies in ruins just north of Beijing, and the crumbling rocks seem to whisper, never again. China decides to take on the Western world and loses in a humiliating way. And then it does it a second time and loses in a humiliating way. Yes, you can tell the narrative that way. That is the narrative every Chinese school child learns. That China endured a century of humiliation. Then the humiliation of the peace settlement at the end of the First World War, where China just gets shafted by the Western allies. That peace settlement, the Treaty of Versailles, led to the famous protests of May 4th, 1919. Students gathered at Tiananmen gates. China had been on the road to democracy, but these disillusioned youth would set it in a new direction. The protests and fury spread across the country and included a 14-year-old revolutionary, Deng Xiaoping. So when he reached power, Deng was determined that China not be humiliated again. He would write the rules. 
how business would be conducted, how boundaries would be honored, how the courts would function, and how human rights would be practiced. He would demand autonomy and respect. Today, Shenzhen is a thriving city, looking more and more like nearby Hong Kong. The skyline soars with high-rise office buildings. In the early days of open and reform policies, Alan Lau opened a Western-style hotel. The first hotel is Bamboo Garden, because I want to take the advantage of the low labor costs. I was very, very happy because I gave him a lot of freedom to manage the Bamboo Garden Hotel. He's still proud of the hotel, its success, and his rather rigid hiring policies. Have you fired anybody? Yes, I did. I fired more than 100 staff in Bamboo Garden Hotel because they don't follow my instructions. But a communist country is supposed to have full employment. This eager capitalist was not in line with the collective. Alan Lau was making enemies. In Beijing, the day after he decided to take the civil service examinations, Ma Jin Yuan got the process started. The civil service examinations involve a face-to-face -face interview and a written exam. Ma is studying up to 16 hours a day. If he passes, he and his family will gain in another way. Anna Huang has quit her job in Peng Lai and enrolled in the Shangzhou Cramming School to prepare for the civil service exam full-time. Her parents are paying for this. It is her second try of these exams. She's expected to pass this time. The mock interview is designed to test her ability to think on her feet. She has only 15 minutes to answer her questions. The cram school is pressure packed. So Anna has gone to the temple at Shangdong for inspiration. One of Confucius's main principles guides Anna's life. Obey your parents and do right for your family. Under Mao, Confucius's teachings were reviled as reasons for the feudalism that held China back. But Deng Xiaoping understood that its core principle of harmonious relations in the family and among citizens, obedience and obligation, could work well in a modern ordered Chinese society. I think Deng was affected by two formative influences. One would be Confucian influences of hierarchy and deference and so forth. But he also learned a great deal from Soviet communism. He understood that the way in which a communist party succeeds is to impose a very tight control over its members and then in turn over society as a whole. So Confucianism and communism actually fit together quite nicely as long as the communist party feels that it's not going to relinquish ultimate control.
Confucius might smile on Gong Hangbing, who is hardworking, diligent, and also dutiful. He shares his house with his in-laws and his mother. And what a house it is. Three stories of marble and gold with an elevator. Gong also believes, as Confucius did, in the power of education. He never got through high school, but his children are being educated in the United States. No civil service dreams here. This is an entrepreneurial family. I like my father's business. After I graduate, I think I will do some internship. And after that, I will take over my parents' business. Firstly, I have to get understand of my father's business. Secondly, I will take business into the internet. Pioneer businessman Alan Lau was always more comfortable with Western entrepreneurs than communist countries. Politically, China have two parties, left party and right party. I belong to the right party. Deng Xiaoping is the right party, you know, capitalism. And the other party is communist. Lau helped guide Shenzhen from a backward small town to a modern metropolis. He did so with the permission and encouragement of Deng Xiaoping. But the old school communists never approved of his plans, nor of his bravado. People started spreading rumors. The rumor said, China is not supporting me. Leftists are against me. The banks became skittish, and his businesses failed. The bank wants me to pay back the money which I cannot pay right away. I went bankrupt. After you went bankruptcy, did you tell Deng Xiaoping about this? No. He's only laid down the policy and also given me the right to exercise the capitalism. That's all. We are not friends. This is business. Alan Lau seems sanguine about his rise and fall. Maybe he always knew that open and reform also meant control. Zhao Gong, the government has built a museum to honor the 18 farmers. They are part of modern Chinese legend. It's living history. In the museum, amidst artifacts and reconstructions, you can imagine their desperate straits, their midnight pact in blood. You can share the drama and daring, even meet a real life hero. But townspeople complain that other communities have profited more from the open and reform policy than they have. They don't want to be relics in China's great transformation. They want to participate. Zhao Gong, no matter how immortalized, is not the modern China in action. The new China involves massive investment, private contracting and state spending. Power, privilege, 
and temptation. Corruption in business and within the civil service has become one of the most serious problems confronting modern China. By focusing on growth at any cost, Dunn ignored emerging corruption and a suffering environment. I think Deng understood that he couldn't control everything that was going on and that to bring about change in the way in which the People's Republic ran its economy was going to require a certain amount of rewards going to the people who were doing it and maybe not always according to the, the, the highest ethical standards. And he was willing to tolerate a small amount of corruption as the cost of lubricating change. I think he felt that at the time when they were starting reform, so many party leaders had suffered so much that if the local official found a way to get things done and start the economy and put a little bit in his pocket, that was not such a disaster. The important thing in his mind was, can that local official do something? It takes an extremely brave person to stand up to China's bureaucracy. Magazine journalist Luo Changping exposed massive corruption in the National Energy Administration. Eventually, the deputy minister, Liu Tianang was convicted of taking about six million dollars in bribes and sentenced to life in prison. In Mao Zedong's time, corruption after more than a decade in power, Deng was threatened by corruption, a massive population, and an impatient youth movement demanding democracy. The demonstrations that started in Tiananmen Square in April 1989 were initially a challenge to corruption. It ends up being called the democracy movement because the students want some kind of say in where the future of their country lies, and they felt they weren't being heard. At the height of the protests, 400,000 people assembled in the square. And then the fateful night of June 4th, It was a massacre. By morning light, the state was back in control, but hundreds of protesters were dead. And Deng Xiaoping's reputation lay in ruins. Deng Xiaoping, by this point, is somewhat too distant from what's going on out in the streets to understand what's at stake. And as the movement grows, he becomes anxious that his project to build a wealthier and more powerful China is going to be compromised. So when push comes to shove, he decides, I have to shut the movement down, and I will use the military to do it. The tanks, the soldiers, the defenseless students, images of that night are seared in Western memory, though not in China. You can bet nothing about this protest will be on this generation's civil service exam. Examination day has arrived. The students join hundreds of thousands across the country. Success will launch their careers, a position in society, and perhaps make their families proud. <laughs> 
Finally, the civil service exams are over. When the results come in, once again, Anna did not pass. She now works at the legal department at a state-owned company in Penglai, but her parents still push her to do better. As Rama Jin Yuan, his diligence has paid off. He too failed the civil service exams, but he was offered a job at the Beijing School of Economic Management, and it comes with a coveted Beijing Hukou. At the first opportunity, Ma takes a long trip home to share the news about his success. <laughs> Ma has not seen his mother for many months. <laughs> his mother hosts a family feast and celebration. Gong Hangbeng has accomplished everything he dreamed of. His world is serene, but his focus still the bottom line. I say, is also from Chinese culture, because of the Si Chou Si Lu. I still think it's because of it that he brought luck and you have to keep on going. Is there any other cultural meaning in it? I just feel that there's no other meaning. I think it's because he inspired me to give back to our family. Alan Lau lives in Vancouver now, and he has been vindicated. In 2003, he was awarded a gold medal by the Chinese government. He went back to Shenzhen to receive the award. The gold medal is given to me, the pioneer uh, special zone. Looking back on his time in Shenzhen, he may be forgiven for saying, I told you so. I made a proposal to Deng Xiaoping, and the population could be jumped up to 10 million. That particular proposal went to all the Chinese leaders. They said, that is impossible. To put that into perspective, Shenzhen's population was only 21,000 when he predicted it would rise to 10 million. Now, Shenzhen, Population already appeared up more than 16 million. Yan Juan Shang, leader of the 18 farmers, can look back on a life well lived. I died, I died. I saw my wife, 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 我的愿望呢，也没被那，就像是讲呢，这个虽然说我在那时候抱着杀头的一个，但也没杀我头。The Chinese government remains at times rigid and unyielding. Corruption is still corrosive. 
But China's economic awakening has been astonishing. And there's no denying that Deng Xiaoping was its architect. In the last century, no leader guided a country from third world despair to superpower as effectively as Deng Xiaoping. No one raised so many people out of poverty. Mao Zedong's embalmed body lies in Tiananmen Square, an emperor's tomb in an extravagant mausoleum. Deng Xiaoping was 92 when he died. His eyes and internal organs were donated to science. His body cremated and his ashes cast out to sea. His memorial is alive still. Diligent people who've been given a chance. Young people who aspire to greatness. Proud people who defy humiliation. A miraculous transformation.